We are heading up and over the hills to a town that was so deadly, people usually only lasted a few months doing this job up here. To the ghost town known as the Widowmaker, Delamar. Delamar, the camp of the deadly dust, lies uninhabited. The deserted streets, which once surged with the wild life of the Golden West, today slumber with a stillness of expectancy. The large buildings on each side are locked, the windows boarded or closed with the iron shutters of another age. In 1889, two prospectors, John Ferguson and Joseph Sharp, discovered gold and silver on the arid, dusty slopes of southeastern Nevada. Near Monkey Wrench Wash, these men located the first inklings of an ore load that would transform this place from a barren patch of uninteresting land into a bustling, wealthy, and ultimately deadly mining town. Some official records from the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology conflict with the discovery year, placing it somewhere in the year 1891 or 1892 rather than 1889. As with most ghost towns and former mining camps, the specifics are sometimes lost to history, and Delamar is no exception. The astute viewer may be wondering about the name Monkey Wrench Wash. The history behind this name is likely mythical, Apparently, Ferguson and Sharp ran off into the wilds of Nevada, unprepared to mine the ore they hoped to locate, and made do with an old discarded and broken tool, the main part of a monkey wrench with all the attachments missing. True or not, this is the story giving attribution to the name of the wash. Just west of Monkey Wrench Wash, the two men and other prospectors established the town of Ferguson. In those early years, the mines produced gold and silver in respectable amounts, but it didn't immediately grow as large as other boomtowns of the time. In fact, the town and the mines faced two primary but common obstacles to western mining ventures. First and foremost, water was scarce and had to be piped in from a well in Meadow Valley Wash, some 12 miles away. The scarcity of this liquid commodity saw it mainly reserved for limited domestic use and immediate milling and processing needs. As the mines progressed deeper into the surrounding rock, no water table appeared, and the use of water in the mining process itself was discouraged and seen as wasteful. Second, the nearly non-existent transportation network to and from Ferguson posed serious challenges for bringing in freight and shipping out ore. No railroads served the area, and all shipping relied on mule teams coming out of Milford, Utah, about 150 miles distant, and traversing incredibly mountainous terrain. Despite these challenges, the nascent mining town clung tenaciously to survival, if only because of the rich and easily exploited ore deposits promising riches and wealth to those who would put down roots in the new town. In 1894, Captain Joseph de la Mar bought the more important and productive mines in the area and renamed the infant town to de la Mar. That same year, the town had achieved a size and status commensurate for the establishment of a post office and a newspaper, the de la Mar Lode. The story of Joseph de la Mar is a curious one, and perhaps one of the more interesting parts of the de la Mar story. Joseph de la Mar was born in Amsterdam, Though his father was a banker, he died when Joseph was only four years old. The earlier years of Joseph's life aren't clear, but sometime in his teens he stowed away aboard a ship bound for the West Indies. Eventually discovered he was pressed into work without pay as a cook's helper. Apparently life at sea agreed with him, and Joseph continued on as a merchant seaman until the age of 20, when he became the master of a ship and eventually received a captain's rank and command. At sea, he visited many ports and expanded his knowledge through observation. He left the merchant service and founded a successful maritime salvage company, reaping handsome profits during the American Civil War. However, his business sense didn't stop at maritime salvage. Joseph noted the patterns of Western trade with Africa, and seeing an opportunity to cut costs, he built vessels that could sail African rivers to trade goods with those living in the interior of the continent. This business also met with great success, but he ultimately found the work to be too unpleasant and too dangerous and sold his interest to an English merchant organization after three years. 
In 1878, Joseph Delamar set foot in New York, about the same time that new mines opened in Leadville, Colorado. Eager for new ventures, he headed to Leadville and purchased several promising claims. He also took private courses in chemistry and metallurgy from a professor at Chicago University to better understand mining, milling, and refining of precious metal ores. A year later, he bought an operational mine in Leadville for $5,500, operated it until 1885, then sold his interest for $130,000, about $4 million in today's currency. Following this same pattern, Joseph worked through several western mining districts, buying low and selling high, making healthy profits the whole time. Finally, in 1896, Joseph turned his eye towards the camp of Ferguson, buying up several of the more productive mines and renaming the town to Delamar. This image shows the expansive town that was Delamar in the 1890s, around the time it was renamed. The many buildings and houses nestled below the Delamar mine are a stark contrast to the empty hills left today. We found this here, look, like a plate. It has a pattern on both sides. I mean, that's that's pretty cool. Artifacts, some of the old artifacts out here. The mines of now Delamar were the primary ore producers in Nevada from 1895 to 1900. In 1897, the town boasted a population of 3,000 residents and had numerous amenities. Aside from the aforementioned newspaper and post office, Delamar now offered a hospital, opera house, several churches, a school, as well as merchants and the requisite saloons for thirsty miners, and rudimentary telephone service. I'm pretty sure this is Main Street, as you can see all the massive buildings would have been right here. So this whole entire place right here would have been full of people. It's kind of weird to be out here now, but you can literally see buildings, what remain of buildings, scattered all over this part here. And this would have been a bustling city with all kinds of people out here, and they would have been going doing their thing. Some signs of plumbing that they had. I don't know if that's a gas line or a water line. I'm thinking water. They had like a grocery stores here. They had hotels. They had everything. It's almost imp it's incredible to imagine what this must have been like to come through, especially right after they abandoned it. In addition to water, Delamar lacked native timber. Most timber imported from California and northern Nevada was expensive and consequently could only be purchased by the mines for bracing and millworks. Consequently, most of Delamar's buildings were constructed of native rock, much of it being a metamorphic stone called quartzite. You can see where they shove mud in between the rocks. But here's a typical construction. Looks like they use some kind of mud. Probably just everything was probably like, looks like they even put concrete on the walls. And think about it, you'd have come around that corner and you'd have just seen this whole entire area full of buildings, like pristine condition. Though it's almost hard to imagine when so little of the town survives to this day, this image of another angle of Delamar shows just how populated the town was, with large-scale buildings, multiple streets, and enough housing for its 3,000 residents. And I believe what happened is I believe a fire came through here and wiped it all out. Despite most of the town being built of stone, a fire in 1900 destroyed nearly everything in Delamar. According to one source, two-thirds of the buildings are destroyed and a thousand persons rendered homeless. Fire today destroyed two-thirds of the town of Delamar, Nevada, including the principal business section and almost all the residences. A thousand people are rendered homeless. The fire started mysteriously in the north end of town and swept steadily southward before a high wind, despite efforts to blow up buildings in its path. This is the second serious fire Delamar has had within a few days. It originated in a stockade in the rear of T.E. Edwards' saloon, where two drunk men had been thrown. They have not been seen since. The water system was of no use, and the one-third of the town remaining can credit its existence to luck. I'm pretty sure this is a bank here. And you can even see where the floor joists would have been right there. They would have ran across to the other side. You can see they've been burned down in a fire. This is more, it like it went up to three stories. And we are coming across here. You can see it's been made or built with the native rocks that are all found in this area, except for, of course, we got some bricks. So they caught on, someone tried to catch it on fire, or maybe it was, that's how it came down on fire. 
They had a window there and a window right there and a fireplace. Look at there's a pipe that runs down. This must have been like their stove and a heater and it goes all the way down here to the ground. This was a flume I must have attached up there. It's surprising to hear that a town built mostly of native stone would succumb to fire. While stone itself won't burn, the items inside and attached to those buildings might, and that would allow the fire to spread. It's also interesting to read that explosives were used to fight the fire. The idea would be to demolish buildings to create a fire break, an area where fire would not burn to limit the extent of the blaze. More often than not, this did little to help matters, yet it would be employed with similar limited success in a more famous city, San Francisco, six years later following a massive earthquake. With gold still to be taken from the ground, Delamar would not give in to fire. Buildings would be erected once again, insurance claims would be paid, and the town would continue to grow and prosper for a time longer, though it would eventually succumb as it earned its name, the Widowmaker. As with most mining towns, Delamar had its share of crime to deal with. Though no outrageous acts are attributed to the place, the P.O. Trekkard carried a regular column called Delamar Dots, a few of these one or two line items paint a more typical and less than romantic picture of the town. Now that the rough element is increasing, the jail question is again being discussed by many. A few drunks are to be seen on our streets every day now. One or two scraps occurred during the week. Oh, this probably was a bank. I see iron shutters right here. Like would have been part of it right there running up and down. That is new. And then you can see vandals showed up and decided to put their names in there. You can still see what, how it would have looked in here. Like well, this little spot right there. I don't know if someone was digging in the walls, probably looking for some kind of treasure. There's the old safe. Although the town rebuilt after the fire, Joseph decided to once again sell his interests in the mines and move on to other ventures in 1902. During his tenure, Joseph's mines produced roughly $8.7 million in gold. Other sources suggest a slightly lower figure at $8.5 million. Although figures only go back to 1913, $8.5 million would roughly equate to more than $250 million in today's money. The new owners eventually installed a 400-ton mill during 1902 to 1903, but shut down all operations in 1909. In terms of economically recoverable gold, the mines had run dry. While ore remained, the cost to mine, mill, and refine that ore meant there was no profit to be made. Over time, the population of Delamar would dwindle to almost nothing and stay that way for 20 years. The Carson City Daily Appeal noted in its April 26, 1911 edition, Passing of the Delamar Mine. The curtain has been rung down for the Bamberger Delamar Gold Mines Company, the affairs of this corporation have been wound up and all done to end its career, except the final discharge of the receiver, and that will probably be done before the close of the present term of the district court, says the P.O. Trekkard. The Bamberger Delamar was one of the leading gold-producing mines of the United States a few years ago. But like every other mine operated for a long period of years, the resources became exhausted. The richer ores were worked out, and when the mine could no longer be operated at a profit, there was but one thing left to do, to close down. In something of a note in passing, the article also mentions that the mine used the dry method for processing the ore. The mill, when it was owned by Captain Delamar and operated with the dry process for the treatment of ores, caused the death of scores of employees of the mill. They became the victims of the fatal Delamar dust. Probably no other metal mine in the world left such a trail of sadness as did the once famous Bamberger Delamar. This dry method of milling, though glossed over in most every newspaper of the time, would earn the town the nickname of the Widowmaker. This is all the native rock. You can see it. There's probably was a downstairs on here. It collapsed, unfortunately. And windows. She got the windows. She got the wood frames. The ores of Delamar came out of quartzite rock a hard, metamorphic stone comprised mostly of silica. Mining in this type of rock produced massive amounts of dust, 
especially given the scarcity of water available for both the town and the mines. Once extracted, the ore would be moved to mills where it was pulverized to aid in the recovery of the gold. This rock dust brought with it countless cases of silicosis. The camp then became known as a man killer. Farm boys who came over from the Mormon settlements in southwestern Utah did most of the work pulverizing. None had heard of silicosis, but they would soon learn. After working in the mines and mill at Delamar for three or four months, they would start coughing. While some managed to hold on for a few years after the cough started, others died within a few weeks. The air was so impregnated with silica dust that even women and children who never went near the mines or mills would occasionally contract silicosis. Even horses eventually died from the dust. Silicosis is an affliction of the lungs caused by the inhalation of silica dust. Normally, we inhale household dust and eventually exhale or cough it out with no lasting ill effects. Silica dust, on the other hand, looks like sharp knives and razor blades under magnification. When the dust enters the lungs, the small particles often lodge deeply in the alveolar sacs, penetrating sufficiently to be incapable of removal by normal biological processes coughing and mucus. An immune response leads to inflammation of lung tissues and the body begins to form nodules around the invading particles as a means of defense. Eventually, the alveolar sacs, which exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide with the air around us, stop working efficiently or at all. For want of oxygen, the sufferer ultimately dies, though they may linger for years depending on the severity of the case. At least several hundred deaths of miners were attributed to silicosis, and the protective measures available at the time proved largely ineffective. Most of those who died were miners and mill workers, leaving behind widows and children, hence the name Widowmaker being attached to Delamar and its mines. The total impact of silicosis remains unknown, though the most published number indicates at least 400 died of the disease in or near Delamar. In one case, the passing of a silicosis-afflicted miner was noted by the newspapers. Word was received here on Monday that John P. Wright had died at Delamar at 9.30 a.m. that day. John Wright, some years ago, worked in the Delamar mill and got a dose of the dust, and since that time has gradually declined. He leaves a wife and two children in Heiko, and two sisters and a brother in Salt Lake to mourn his loss. Perhaps John Wright was one of the unlucky ones, dealing with years of declining health and a slow death, compared to some of those who passed in a matter of weeks or months from more acute manifestations of silicosis, despite not all being miners or mill workers. Mr. Hobbs, well and favorably known at Delamar, died at the hospital Friday night of pneumonia. He had been employed as blacksmith at the Delamar for some short time past. Despite the diagnosis of pneumonia, this was likely another case of silicosis, as misdiagnosis at this time was common. Here's a building that is directly across from the cemetery. It makes me wonder if this might have been like the morgue where they brought the bodies before they took them out there. Perhaps due to the pall of dust and death that hung over Delamar, on August 17, 1921, the Daily Appeal reported that only 10 people remained in Delamar. Whether they thought the town would be revived or had no place else to go is unknown. In some sense, their optimism would be temporarily rewarded. Between 1927 and 1933, the Reno Evening Gazette published at least three stories suggesting Delamar was to be revived by varying mining interests, primarily to rework waste and tailing piles for unrecovered gold. The April 5, 1933 edition of the Reno Evening Gazette finally carried some good news about the town. Sections of these tailings assayed over $10 in gold, and over 1,000 tons were shipped to the Garfield plant of the American Smelting and Refining Company. The goal was to use the cyanide heap leaching method on the massive tailings piles, and by all accounts they recovered some gold. Whatever the final recovery may have been, it wasn't enough to keep the town alive for any significant length of time. Despite Agnes Horn, an original resident of Delamar, shipping ore as late as 1940, 
By 1941, she had sold her claims for a substantial cash figure. In spite of her windfall, Mrs. Horn apparently remained in Delamar until her death around 1946. Frederick Horn from 1912, and uh, who's that, Cyrus Horn? And then we've had multiple graves here where there's nothing at all left. We have no idea who was here. The year 1957 saw some more brief interest in the town, but the record stops around this time. In 1957, it's safe to say Delamar finally and officially passed into the realm of other ghost towns, never to be revived, serving only as a desolate reminder of the determined men and women who made their homes, lives, and in some cases, deaths in this forgotten place. <laughs>